Hey everybody, it's RJ, your host, and welcome to Hash It Out. When it comes to cannabis, CBD, and pregnancy, the questions certainly outweigh the answers currently. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Gina Dubay and Dr. Leslie Apgar of Greenhouse Wellness to clarify some of the questions regarding cannabis and CBD use while pregnant. We'll also discuss the importance of new research into the efficacy of cannabis and CBD use in women's health, mental health, and more. Without further ado, let's hash it out. My guests today are the founders of the Maryland-based cannabis company, Greenhouse Wellness. Welcome to the show, Gina Dubay and Dr. Leslie Apgar. Hello, thank you so Hi. much for joining me today. Hi, thank you so much for having us. No problem, no problem. Now y'all are over in Maryland at the moment, if I have that right. We are. Okay, okay. In the spring, the springtime, has spring cracked over there yet? Or no, are we still? It's trying, but it's not really succeeding. <laughs> I mean, we're still so... wearing jackets and boots outside. We're really excited for it to be above 70 degrees here any day now. Yes. Ooh, okay, okay. Well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I hope you all see that. I hope you all see that sun pretty soon. Um, I'm excited to talk to you too about, uh, you know, just sort of clarifying a little bit regarding uh, CBD and cannabis usage uh, for those who are pregnant. You know, there's a, still a lot of uh, misinformation, anecdotal evidence, a lot of uh, maybe potentially outdated evidence or, or information out there um, that I am excited to sort of uh, pick apart with y'all today and maybe offer some clarification for our viewers and listeners out there. Um, just a little background on the two of you, just to familiarize our audience. Uh, Gina Dubé, you have over 30 years of cross-functional expertise with background in um, sales, marketing, and business development. Dr. Leslie Apgar, you are a physician born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you graduated with an honors program at the Washington State University with a BS in zoology and attended uh, Penn State University for medical school. Did I get that right? Did that you sound did. that check out? Okay, yeah. awesome. Got the fact check. Perfect. Love it. So um, just tell me a little bit more about Greenhouse Wellness. I understand that uh, the two of you sort of look at yourselves as maybe an unlikely pair to sort of open up this company. And, um, you know, despite the tumultuous past year, I guess, for lack of a better term, that's maybe sugarcoating it. Uh, you over at Greenhouse Wellness have managed to double your business in 2020. So first and foremost, congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, can you all just tell me a little bit more about how you started this company and what the, the past year has been like for you all? Well, we started the company four years ago. Uh, we had bid for a state procurement for cannabis. And I was a total novice at cannabis at the time. We were backdoor neighbors. That's how we met. We've been friends for ages. And Leslie finds unique opportunities that straddle Eastern and Western medicine and brought this opportunity to me. Um, we didn't bid that one as a man, of course, because the gentleman who brought it to us um, Mansplain. Well, Gina asked a valid question and he just basically said, oh, sweetie, you would never understand the math. And it just, um, what? I'm pretty sure she would understand the math. In fact, she'd right. have to explain it to me and probably to you too. So anyway, um, we decided that wasn't a good match. And then apparently Gina got a little irritated. And when Gina gets irritated, she gets even. And so she opened up the laptop <laughs> She looked up the uh, request for proposal from the state and she said, you know what, Les, we're just going to do this ourselves. Let's just do it. And I said, you've lost your ever loving mind. Like, what are you talking about? We have no cannabis experience. Cannabis was not taught to me in medical school. I don't even know what an endocannabinoid system is. What are you talking about? She's like, we'll just do it. it we're going to, I'm going to write a rubric and how many points each question is worth. We're just going to do it. I'm like, okay. So we did. And then much to our delight and shock and shock. We won a year later, and then it was like, oh, crap, now what do we do? <laughs> so Greenhouse in Business, this is our fourth year. Uh, we were one of the first dispensaries in Maryland, medical marijuana, Maryland's only medical right now. And we have been so fortunate. We have truly the sickest patients in the state. And sadly, our business doubled during COVID because so many more people are anxious, sleepless, suffering from anxiety. Uh, it is just 
been a tough year for most of America. Yeah, COVID really took us all down hard, um, medically and then obviously emotionally and mentally. And we noticed right away that much like alcohol sales were spiking, cannabis sales were spiking as well. And not only did they spike, but they were a sustained increase. More and more people entered the cannabis program, we found. And we've had a number of patients who've come to us and said, you know, you guys saved my life. I would have killed, I would have killed myself or I just, Mm. I can't thank you enough for providing us these products. And it's really helped me get through this bad period of of time. So certainly that's part of why I think we have weathered the COVID storm. But also I think we, we put out a a quality product where we have a reputation of being the place you go when you want real medical knowledge about cannabis. And it's, you know, most of the cannabis industry is a recreational market that's just masquerading as a medical one. And we really turned that on its head and made it, you know, really, we're going to talk about CBD first here and then, yeah, a little bit of THC, but the more Mm. THC is not the better. And I always tell patients, it's like going to get a nice Pinot Noir for your salmon dinner and you go to the wine store and you're like, oh, you know what? Let me just get Everclear because that has the highest (laughs) alcohol. Well, you've ruined your nice salmon dinner with your friends. I mean, that is not the point. And that's also not the way the chemistry works. So when you do take a deep dive into this, as I had to, because I didn't know anything about this whole, um, you know, industry, you learn the chemistry and the way that the pharmacodynamics work in the body. And you start treating this plant with more elegance and more sophistication. And the patients Mm. love it. They respond. They don't want to be impaired the vast majority of our patients do not want to be impaired. So yeah, it's, it's been, I think there's a few reasons why we've been successful, but we're grateful. Like Gina said, we're so grateful for our patients. We're grateful for their trust in us. And uh, it's been a wild ride. (laughs) And it's so rewarding to see someone who was on opioids is no longer on opioids or someone who couldn't function because they're terminal with cancer, be able to write letters to their loved ones and their children. And so there's gratification in so many ways. Yeah, that that's, uh, you know, it is certainly a silver lining in um, a uh, unprecedented, again, to use that word and, and to beat it to death, an unprecedented dark time that we're facing across um, the globe with, uh, you know, the, the pandemic really affecting people's mental health. Uh, I certainly haven't been immune to that over the past year. And uh, cannabis has certainly helped me through uh, uh, um, this past year uh, in particular. I like, uh, uh, Dr. Apgar, that you mentioned uh, th- that uh, you made that correlation between um, cannabis and, and like a Pinot Noir, like a, a wine that you're selecting for your dinner, that you don't just go for that Everclear because it has that highest uh, alcohol content, just like you don't necessarily want to target the highest THC content if you're looking for uh, any sort of therapeutic relief, um, which right. might be contradictory to a lot of commercialized cannabis operations out there that are really just chasing those high THC levels. And um, it makes you sort of question, you know, what your motives are as a company if you're striving for for that. Um, because, you know, the, the, the demand has certainly increased over the pandemic. Um, but is that... Uh, you know, is that a, a morally responsible decision, I guess, is a, a completely different conversation. And uh, you also mentioned uh, CBD use. And uh, that's what I uh, mentioned at the top of the show I wanted to talk about today, because when you look at, uh, you know, just running a, a simple Google search of, of CBD and, and pregnancy can really send you down a rabbit hole, uh, as it has for me this week. Um, and it's already affected my my YouTube or, or my uh, Instagram uh, advertisement algorithms. Now I'm seeing like pregnancy ads all over the place. But, um, I, you know, there's so many questions out there. Is CBD safe? Can you take CBD? Does the, the mode of consumption matter? So I guess I just want to start with the overall question. How safe uh, and how efficable do you think CBD can be or, or is for those who are pregnant? So uh, it turns out that just because you can buy something over the counter does not, in fact, make it safe. And we just don't know about cannabinoids and pregnancy. We haven't done the studies, but happily, I can report 
that the University of Washington, out of my old Seattle stomping grounds, is actually recruiting patients right now. It got delayed because of COVID. And I'm so delighted that we're going to actually have human-based study here in our country that we can mm -hmm. draw some conclusions on. But what we do know is that heavy adolescent use of THC causes structural changes in the brain. And that scares me as a physician. I don't like the idea of a structural change in the brain. I don't know what clinical significance it has, but we know that because this system is so primitive and in so it permeates every cell in our body, that it's really an important system. And I don't want to necessarily mess with it while we're pregnant and while we're breastfeeding, because those neural pathways that are set are so important. And so if our endocannabinoid tone is off because we're taking supplemental cannabinoids from a plant or a bottle or whatever, it's just, it's really unsettling. So the American College of OBGYN has put out a blanket statement that says, we just don't know, it's not recommended. And that's gonna be their blanket statement for quite a while until some significant studies can change everybody's mind. But I will say that the way to practice medicine is individualize it. And if I had a patient that was really at risk and her baby was at risk for, say, hyperemesis gravidarum, which is a terrible, debilitating disease of just the worst morning sickness that lasts all day long. And patients are often admitted to the hospital and given parenteral nutrition through an IV. And it's dangerous for her. It might be the better part of valor to have her use a cannabinoid versus some of those other hardcore medications that I personally have actually prescribed to women that I don't have safety data on necessarily, but it happens to be prescribed from big pharma. So I definitely think that there is um, a lot to learn and I remain very open-minded. I would counsel our listeners that if you are looking at CBD over the counter and you think that it is in fact CBD, buyer beware, because a lot of products do not actually even contain any CBD and some products do not contain what they say that they are. There can be a variation of significant milligrams on either side of what is listed. And then the most important thing, there could be THC in there. And there could be enough THC in there that it actually makes you test positive on a drug test. So any CBD that is consumed by our listeners, please make sure that you're looking for something called a certificate of analysis. That means it's been sent to an independent um, third testing party for verification that it is what they say it is. And it's free of contaminants and harmful agents. And then beyond that, I really just unfortunately don't have great news for our listeners. I would love to be able to say that cannabinoids are safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding, but I'm just waiting for the data to come in. Oh, certainly. Well, I mean, that's certainly I we're not looking to to just give them the good news, right? We're looking to give them the actual facts. And so that's completely fine. It's it's it is interesting, though, to see when you search online, um, you see a lot of like I've noticed a lot of people saying like, yes, basically, like you can use that. And like, here are some products like like a listicle almost of like the top 10 CBD products for pregnancy. And that sort of stuff, I feel like is very concerning because like you said, you don't know what might be in this. You don't know if it has that CSA, that certificate of analysis. Like um, there's a lot of still a lot of variables, a lot of moving parts in this rather uh, nascent and still ever evolving industry that is the, the CBD and and cannabis industries. Um, I'm, I'm curious to ask you about what you think the differences are when it comes to uh, modes of consumption. Because with CBD products, you can have, for example, uh, a smokable CBD flower. You can have a CBD tincture. You can have a CBD topical. From what you've seen, how do those differ so in the, terms? Yeah, please. That's a great question. The bioavailability of cannabinoids is tremendous when inhaled. So vaped is the best way of getting medication into your bloodstream. And I mean right now. And you don't need as much to get the job done. Your serum levels are much higher with a less amount of intake if you smoke or vape. Now, I don't know many doctors that are going to encourage patients to combust or smoke. And Gina and I certainly were not... Uh, excited about the idea of selling flour for people to smoke. However, our attitudes have become adjusted. We have learned how to meet people where they are, but I still encourage patients to vape the flour 
or vape mm. the oil that has been tested and has been purchased from a legitimate source, not the black market. We call that whole thing with popcorn lung and everything, uh, vape gate. But yes, to vape arise is a very safe way of medicating and you don't need very much to get the job done. It doesn't last as long. It's only about an hour and a half maybe of uh, relief. If you eat the cannabinoids, it takes about um, even up to a couple of hours for full effect. And a lot of times patients will say, well, it's not working. Let me take more. And that's when we get into the overdose of the THC problems. Yes. Um, it's also converted into um, products that are or um, co compounds that are about 10 times stronger. So THC is converted to something called 11-hydroxy-THC by the liver, which is 10 times stronger than Delta-9. And it lasts a good amount of time. Like you're looking at six, six to eight hours sometimes. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Gina, I was wondering if you could tell me what the education process is like for your uh, uh, patients, for your customers. Um, what is, how much are you putting into sort of getting this information out to the people in your community? And what has it been like to go through that um, educational process that I feel like almost every cannabis company has to be a part of in some way? You know what I mean? Because there is, like you said, still this lack of data that we're, we're waiting on, you know? Education is key for us, and it becomes twofold, one of which is to our patient base, which we do through weekly emails, Facebook, Instagram, as well as recorded sessions on how to do different things. And Dr. Apgar has a residency program, for lack of a better word, where she trains all of our wellness consultants. We have monthly quizzes and tests so that everybody's at the same level. Now, we have different people who specialize in different areas, of course. We have several who specialize in the terminally ill or another set who might do dabbles and concentrates. But we want something for each of our patients, and we want a well-rounded, educated staff to help them because things change so fast in the industry and the data is ever-changing. Yeah. And, you know, patients email us. We give out our personal um, email at Greenhouse Wellness. And so the patients will email the wellness consultants directly sometimes. Sometimes they just pick up the, the phone and call. And the wellness consultants will walk over to that area of the store that they're interested in learning more about. And they'll kind of give them a, a heads up and help refine their selections. Because we have, what, 300 products or something? Yeah, we have uh, I mean, the it's, largest menu in Maryland. It's a lot. Of, I mean, if, you, if you're new and you're just getting started, it certainly will make your head explode. So we like to try <laughs> and take the, the fear away and, and help people navigate this very safely. And we always try to start certainly. slow and low, just depending on if you've used cannabis before. If you're elderly, you don't want that risk of fall. Yeah. So there's a lot of different criteria that go in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking again uh, um, about the sort of lack of data or, or the need to um, accrue more data and do more studies and, and conduct more research. Uh, there was uh, an NIH study that was released uh, just last month, right? It's May, we're recording this. So yeah, last month in April um, that showed that uh, recreational cannabis usage uh, for those uh, who are pregnant may result in um, uh, negative um, impacts on, on your unborn child, including uh, premature delivery and low birth weight. Um, you know, the study came out, like I said, last month. And if you were to just read that headline, it's very concerning, right? But then if you look further into that study, you find that the study was conducted between the years 2001 and 2012 in California. So this is before recreational cannabis uh, legalization had occurred in, in California. So this is all, uh, we're guessing with unregulated products in a black market, sort of illicit market um, environment. So what are your thoughts on the NAH putting out a, a study like that based on evidence that's from years ago? And, um, you know, is that even valid at this point? Uh, certainly we need new studies and, yeah. and current data. I mean, um, so well, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? So first of all, the studies that have looked at this in the past have all often been confounded by the fact that patients were also using tobacco. And we know clearly uh, in OB data 
that nicotine has an adverse effect on patients. There's preterm rupture of membranes, preterm labor, low birth weight. So that needs to, to really be ferreted out. Was there a control to rule out concomitant use of other illicit substances? Also, if nobody's looking at um, testing, and I um, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but California hasn't necessarily been the leader of the pack as far as establishing great safety standards and testing requirements. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's you have no idea what was actually being taken into their bodies. So I just have a hard time drawing any meaningful conclusions from that. But I will say that the endocannabinoid system is intimately involved with all elements of reproduction. It's so, it has huge value in the female reproductive tract. And so all of those things that you said, you know, preterm labor, um, low birth weight, those are all things that the endocannabinoid system is a part of helping to control. So I'm very interested to know what actually we find out as we get more and more data. Does it matter what your innate endocannabinoid tone is? If I'm deficient, do I need to take can cannabinoids from a plant source? to raise my levels up to normal? Does that help what me? What is normal? What is normal? Does normal, mm. I mean, because apparently normal is different for Gina, obviously. She can handle 10 milligrams of THC. I'd have to go to sleep for a week. But, you know, <laughs> it is, everybody's tone is different. So I'm just so excited to see some real, you know, robust data coming in. This unfortunate study is not what I would consist, consider good robust data, but certainly it's totally. a talking point. As long as it's, uh, cannabis is on schedule one, we're not going to get the quality data we need or want. And if there is one resounding initiative that should happen is to take cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 so we can get federally funded research. Mm -hmm. And it's just so silly, though, because the synthetic cannabinoids are not, I mean, they're like Schedule 3 and 4. I think Epidiolex, which is CBD, is a Schedule 4. So what yeah. is it, guys? Yeah, Marinol, I can't remember what that is, a three maybe. I, I it just, it's uh, crazy. It's all over the map, yeah. yeah I don't totally. understand, you know, it just it doesn't make sense. Because we just want to be able to create wellness and, and health in patients. We don't like putting Band-Aids on things. We'd like to create a lack of inflammation. If you can, you know, mm. what, if, we, if we can quench or, or squelch that inflammation at its source, then you're not going to get the inflammatory issues, the bowel disease, the arthritis, the cancers. So it's really just about promoting health and balance. And funny enough, as horrific as COVID has been, there are silver, some silver linings. And for any of, of those of you who have lost people that you love and cherish, you know, my heart goes out to you. But I will say that it has been an opportunity for us all to take a big deep breath and really look hard at what we want in our lives. And what a lot of my patients are saying is that they want more time in nature and they want more just sort of time to reflect and take care of themselves. I can't tell you the number of people I'm seeing that are starting to really focus on the food that they're eating and their exercise. They're really kind of turning the lens from an outward looking to a more inward looking. And I just think mm. that is that is a win. So I will take that as a small consolation prize for having to endure this terrible pandemic with everyone. Certainly. And, and so... With that being said, um, looking forward, what are you most um, excited about for, for the rest of the year and, and for uh, hopefully the years ahead? I mean, federal legalization, are you looking forward to that? What, what, and uh, at, at Greenhouse Wellness, what do you guys have in the works? Well, we have a couple of things in the works. We, like everyone else, are hoping the safe banking bill passes and the legalization bill passes. Though I think we've got a, a bit of time before that happens. Uh, we released a product for women called Blissiva, which is a combination of the word bliss and sativa, and it's aimed just at the problems that women encounter through menopause, through menstruation. So Dr. Apgar derived it based on her knowledge. So we have one line out that's for anxiety and sleep, a line out that's for pain, and soon to come a line out for sex called Smolder, which is a two-part product for women. But I, we think a lot of men are going to buy it too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for a everyone. <laughs> totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. yeah, but we just want right to really, we want to elevate the whole industry. We want to really refine it and sophisticate mm -hmm. it in whatever small way that we can, and we want to certainly make sure that every everybody's voice is heard. 
that we're mm-hmm. able to target the minorities and the women out there. And it's not just about white men and what they might want in the, this industry. We really want to make sure that all the products that we are releasing are attractive to everybody because it makes mm-hmm. the industry better when we listen to everybody's voice. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that mission. And thank you so much, y'all, for, for coming on here and offering a little clarification for uh, someone who was certainly ignorant on this topic, such as myself. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your insight and uh, sharing your time and perspective with me and our listeners today. I really appreciate it. And please continue to stay safe and be well out in Maryland. Again, it's been a tumultuous year to say the least, um, but I am glad to see and hear that Greenhouse Wellness has been doing well over the past year and you all have so many great things in the works. Um, We'll certainly be keeping an eye on the latest data and um, if another crazy study comes out, I would love to have y'all t- uh, back on the show to, to dissect it again. <laughs> That'd be great. That sounds great. We would love it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Gina Dubay and Dr. Leslie Apgar of Greenhouse Wellness. Thank y'all so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And that is it for Hash It Out, y'all. Thank y'all so much for watching, listening, commenting, subscribing. I'm your host, RJ Balde, as always. And I'll catch you next time. Peace out. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out our channel. Click here to watch another episode of Hash It Out. To find more cannabis industry reporting, insider stories, and to stay up to date on the latest trends, make sure to subscribe and keep up with our Trichomes community app. Download it now for free and we'll see you there.